Even though I do predominantly F1 stuff here, I find endurance racing to be cool. The fact that a manufacturer can build a car, sell it to a team or build it for just themselves, and then that team puts it all together, sets it up, puts two to four drivers in and sends it out for 6, 10, 12 or even 24 hours and could be out there for 24 hours with no issues, working completely flawlessly for all that time. Now the coolest of these endurance races for me is the LMP1 category, the spaceships that were the top category of Le Mans and the World Endurance Championship that had about as much tech on them as the USS Enterprise, but before these prototypes, there was GT1. As mentioned in the McLaren F1 and the Jag XJ220 videos I did a couple of weeks ago, all of this gets going in the immediate aftermath of the demise of the Group C category that ended in 1992. There's been multiple references to this period in other videos and the whole video dedicated to this so I'll just keep things brief. Basically the FIA tried to get F1 and the World Sports Car Championship to have a crossover in tech so that teams could do both, but on the sports car front it just got far too expensive with other concerns. So in order to save the prestigious 24 hours of Le Mans, the ACO made several concessions for the 1993 and 1994 editions of the race to allow the grids to be as large as possible, even allowing the older Group C machinery to race under certain conditions to allow teams to enter what they'd already got. In the background, the FIA, now under the leadership of Max Mosley, as well as the ACO, started working on new categories with which to replace Group C with. Because with the death of Group C, the attendances at Le Mans were down, and in the final years of Group C there had been mass protests from fans who didn't take kindly to the rules being fiddled with in the manner in which they were being fiddled. So in 1994, three men by the names of Jürgen Barth, Patrick Peter and Stefan Rattel created BPR, an organisation that would kind of fill the gap left by the World Sports Car Championship. But unlike the World Sports Car Championship, this series would be for production sports cars modified to a certain set of rules, whereas the World Sports Car Championship allowed for custom-built race cars capable of pushing the boundaries of what was achievable. Any sports car could enter provided minimum build requirements were met for the category in which that car was racing, if that makes any sense. The first season in 1994 was mostly made up of sports cars from national series combined into one international series that raced on continental Europe with a visit to Suzuka and a street circuit in Zhuhai, China for the final two rounds of that season. Initially it started out as the Porsche and Venturi Cup, but then others started to enter, such as Ferrari F40s, Corvettes and Lotus Esprits. 28 cars arrived for the first round at Paul Ricard, with no entries in GT2, a few in GT3, one GT4 and then a bunch of GT5s which we'll get to in a minute. But the entry lists as a whole are just inconsistent. There were local teams that entered as a one-off at their local round, so a few Spanish teams at Harama for instance, with the largest entry list being, unsurprisingly, at Spa. But the overall concept of the season seemed to be of interest to manufacturers and in 1995 the series expanded from 8 to 12 rounds and attracted those manufacturers, like McLaren, who went on to dominate the season. Mc McLaren brought the F1, Ferrari the F40 GTE and Jaguar the XJ220, and the manufacturer involvement in 1995 meant that the series shrunk to just two classes for 1996, as the slower, older National Cup cars had been... Well I wouldn't say forced out, but the series had reached that point where it just wasn't worth them turning up because they had no chance of being competitive. Now it has to be said here that there might be a few bits and pieces off with that whole section because one source is saying that the series had four classes, GT1 to GT4, yet on a site that contains all the results for the season in 1994 has GT1 all the way down to GT5. But the whole concept remains the same, production sports cars modified and then put onto a track. It's essentially if you took British touring cars, but instead of it being a Vauxhall Vectra or any other car your dad would have driven, it was a Ferrari F40. The amount of work to get it race ready wasn't that great, and you could race it in a national series or in this one. And because the manufacturers had entered, the costs went up, and it also opened the door for a bit of the usual doing stuff that's not against the letter of the rulebook, but more against the spirit of the rulebook, and no prizes for guessing which manufacturer did that. Yep, Porsche. Long story short is Porsche had built a homologation special. The 911 GT1 was basically a 962 Group C car made to look like the 993 and then they just built the minimum required street legal versions to keep that within the rules. But what that did was usher GT1 into a new era. The second GT1 era involved Patrick Peter leaving BPR and the organisation evolved into the Stefan Rattel organisation or SRO. Things might start to seem a little bit familiar now. With the ongoing success of the series it attracted the attention of the FIA and the SRO with the FIA put on the FIA GT Championship, with the FIA running the rulebook and SRO running the commercial rights. So it allowed the FIA and SRO to have a similar relationship to how Formula 1 worked, with Bernie running the commercial side and 
the FIA doing the regulations. The FIA relaxed the rulebook, maybe a bit too liberally as we'll get to in a minute, and Rattel managed to get the series on Eurosport, with the manufacturers taking this new rulebook and going absolutely mental with it. The opening of the rulebook allowed for more exotic materials, better aero, bigger brakes, bigger tyres and basically anything to make it go as fast as it could on the track, subject to the wider rulebook. This was made even easier for the manufacturers as they only had to make 25 road going examples of that same car to be allowed into the series, which compared to the homologation rules in the BTCC for instance, was nothing. The BTCC at this exact same time required 2,500 examples of that particular car, but then again, those cars are road cars, they're going to sell more. But then again, that didn't stop Alpha doing that rule dodge in 1994. One of those cars was the Mercedes CLK GTR Strassen version, a thoroughbred racing car that could, subject to you having the right amount of marks, be sat on your driveway. And Mercedes wasn't doing things by halves either, as most of the components on that car were lifted directly from the car racing in the FIA GT series. This thing had a 7 litre V12 capable of over 600 horsepower in its roads to spec and chucked out enough torque to get you to Neptune and back in less than 6 minutes. And it wasn't without luxuries either, it had ABS, it had a stereo, it had air conditioning and you could have tartan leather or Alcantara seats. So as you can see here, the race version and the road version aren't that different. These are the monsters that the FIA was allowing on the track, although the race version was not allowed traction control, ABS or anything of the sort. The only driver aid it was allowed was brake bias control. The McLaren F1 GTR was also on the grid, an updated version of the 1995 Le Mans winning car to comply with this new rulebook. McLaren would win the opening round of the season, would take three other wins, but the Mercedes would win six of the 11 races and win the championship by 13 points. But as you can imagine, this is where things start to get a bit problematic. For 1998, McLaren withdrew knowing that it wasn't going to compete with Porsche or Mercedes. There was also the issue that you didn't actually have to have a road version built, you just had to have proof of concept and then Pinky promised the FIA you'd build the 25 cars, which is basically what Porsche did at Le Mans in 1994, which is a video I've done previously. When Mercedes won the 1997 championship, not a single Strassen version of that CLK had rolled out of the factory. And then in 1998, Mercedes went and won every single race, which made everybody else go, what's the point in turning up? So the 1999 season was just GT2 cars, with not a single GT1 in sight. There's also a funny irony here that Porsche had pulled out because, well essentially Mercedes had out homologation specialed Porsche. I suppose it did all bite Mercedes in the arse though because at the 1999-24 hours of Le Mans, that was when the backflips happened. It does also have to be said at this point that that backflipping Mercedes was built to LMGTP regulations and the whole prototype thing in terms of the early years of LMP1 had just started. So Le Mans was in this other weird transitional phase if that makes any sense. I'm not going to say thanks to Mercedes but GT1 was dead. At least the prototype GT1 was dead and in its place for 1999 saw GT2 renamed GT1 and the privateer class below that would be GTS. There would still be a good choice of cars on the grid. The Viper GTSR, the Corvette C6R, the Lister Storm, the Maserati MC Hammer or whatever it was called, uh, the, the MC12 and I remember seeing that thing on Top Gear as a teenager and thinking that was a cool car. Some of those cars would come later into the 2000s though, and if you own the racing game GTR 2, you've probably driven a few of them, and it's a game I highly recommend if this era of racing is your thing. And this version of GT1 is the era that lasted the longest. From 1999 to 2009, it would be the FIA's top class of sports car racing. Well, 1999 to 2012 it would be, but we'll get to that in a minute. In 2004, the FIA relaxed the rule again, but not in the same way it did in the late 90s. It wasn't making that mistake again, but this allowed for supercars such as the MC12 to enter along with the Celine S7. The MC12 would be the dominant car, to the point where the FIA had to start nerfing it to allow the other cars to keep up, and in this period it seemed to have found the right spot. You had pros, you had privateers, you had dentists, you had journeyman pros, you had manufacturer back pros, and guys who had F1 experience. David Brabham, Andrea Montermini, Pedro Lamy, Oli Gavin, Tiffany Dell, Julian Bailey, Ricardo Zonta and others. But 2009 would be the final season as a multi-class series as GT1 would get its own championship in 2010. 
This was called the FIA GT1 World Championship and existed through 2010 and 2011. But in 2012, they wanted to switch things up and allow other classes to be part of a combined class called GT World, where 2009 spec GT2 cars could be modified into the class, as well as allowing GT3 cars, the current GT3 sort of spec of cars if you want to call it that, that had just been BOP to hell to get them all on the same level. And I think that proposed GT3 modification became GTE. But none of the GT2 teams were interested, and only a couple of the GT1 teams were willing to play along. So the 2012 GT1 Championship became... a GT3 series. That season was the last GT1 season, but even then it was just GT1 in name only because the grid was, well, GT3 cars. As with many other categories, high costs, older spec machinery not being replaced, arguments over the calendars and so on just led to lack of participation. And that GT3 series from 2012 morphed into the... Um, I've got to read this now. The Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS. Powered by. It sounds so eSporf. And I'll admit, GT1 is a series that completely passed me by. While I would watch the 24 hours of Le Mans on Eurosport, the wider world of GT racing wasn't something I was actively following, as I was predominantly watching F1 and what was left of the BTCC in that period, which I guess is a story for another day that dark period of British saloon car racing between 2001 and 2010. But looking back, there were some cool looking cars on the grid. Cars that were designed to just go fast, even if it just ended up becoming another GT3 series at the end. But what are your memories of it all? Let me know down in the comments. So then I look back at the slightly complicated era that was GT1. If this has been something new for you, do like the video and for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on any future content. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help out at a more personal level, there is a link to Patreon down in the description, along with a link to Discord, socials, channel memberships, and other bits and pieces. Or the super thanks if you're just one of these one-and-done donation types. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.